Most of us are familiar with the idea that, well, we do things a little differently on Sunday evenings than we do on Sunday mornings. At the Sunday morning service, you know, we serve communion to everyone in the auditorium about midway through the, through the service. You know how it goes, we have the announcements to begin the service, uh, songs, prayer, communion in the middle there, the sermon, song, perhaps a closing prayer, we do that every Sunday. And then at Sunday evening service, we do things differently, don't we? We have the announcements, and then the songs, and then the sermon, and then more prayer, and then another song, and then we do the communion at the end of the service, and we don't do it here. The people who haven't had communion, they go to our fellowship hall, or down the hall, and someone is there to serve them communion, and they take the communion separate from the rest of us. Now the reason I'm, I'm highlighting this difference in the order of our worship between Sunday morning and, and Sunday evening is because I want to talk about the difference between teaching and tradition. Bible teaching versus church tradition. In Acts chapter 2 verse 42, Luke says that the early disciples followed diligently the apostles' teaching. He doesn't say they followed diligently the apostles' traditions, they followed the apostles' teaching. And of course, Jesus summarized his teachings when he said, teach them to observe all that I have commanded you in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18, uh, uh, 28, 18 to 20. So, when Jesus spoke these words, there were, you know, there were no church buildings per se, no programs, no TV, uh, no expensive seminars, you know, uh, to teach His word. His teaching was simple to understand, but also complicated for those who were trying to obey it. You know, love your enemy, I, I can understand that, but there's a big difference between understanding love your enemy, what that means, and actually loving your enemy. Uh, he said, love your brother, again, I, I can understand that but there's a big difference between loving my brother or understanding that idea and actually doing it, or preaching the gospel to the lost, or being faithful to your spouse, or being faithful to Christ until, the, until death. All those ideas that he taught and, and told his apostles to teach others, uh, they're easy to understand, not so easy to, to do. So his disciples formed congregations where they were taught by the apostles and others in how to obey these things. And they grew in their ability to live the Christian life. Kind of a simple formula here so far. Remember, the initial goal was to remain faithful to Jesus until He returned. That was the initial goal, still is. In the first century, most of the disciples thought that He would return within their lifetimes. Yeah, it was a foreseeable future thing. Remain faithful till he returns. Most of them thought, well, he'll be returning in my lifetime. I think I can do that. For this reason, the structure of the church was fluid at the beginning and mostly you know, consisted of groups that met in homes and rented places. As it became apparent that Jesus was not necessarily coming sooner, that in fact he could return at any time, even in the distant future, Churches began to be organized. And so we see Paul providing more structural information about church organization and conduct in 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus. And then there's an effort to collect and preserve the writings of the apostles. This movement begins in the 2nd century. And Christians begin building and maintaining actual buildings, church buildings, um, second and third century, and then certain traditions concerning the hierarchy of the church and its practices begin to take on a, a doctrinal status by the fourth century. Now, that their structure and organization in the church, I, I'm not knocking this, this is, this is a good thing. It's a biblical thing. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, if you have your Bibles, I'm going to read out of that. If you'd like to read along with me. 1 Timothy chapter 3, 
Beginning in verse 14, <clears throat> Paul is writing to young evangelist Timothy, giving him instruction about being an evangelist, about organizing the church, and so on and so forth. And he says the following in verse 14, he says, I am writing these things to you, hoping to come to you before long, but in case I am delayed, I write so that you will know how one ought to conduct himself in the household of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and support of the truth. He was giving him instruction, not only about his own personal development, his own personal conduct as an evangelist, his ministry, but also how to select elders and deacons, how the church should be structured. Now, what is, what is not biblical is when we take our traditions or ways of doing things and we elevate these things, these religious habits, these customs, and we make them equal to God's commands. That's, that's a problem that's you know, been there for a long, long time. It's what the Pharisees did and what they were condemned for in Mark chapter seven, verse seven. You know, when, when Jesus faced the angry mob of men who wanted to stone a woman to death who was guilty of adultery, what did He say to them? Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And what does it say? And no one dared to do it because they realized that they were all guilty. They all realized they were guilty of something. Well, in the same way, you know, sometimes we cast this stone and yet we're guilty of it. We tell perhaps some of our family members who may be Catholics, we say to them, and I've done this myself. We tell them you know, that, well, there's nothing in the Bible about you know, no meat on Friday. There's nothing in the Bible about baptizing babies. Those are just your church traditions. Those are your Catholic traditions. You ought to get rid of those things. Just stick to the book. Or perhaps we say to our Protestant friends or family, you know, there's nothing in the New Testament that supports the use of instruments of music in worship. That's just your church's tradition. You got to get rid of that stuff. But we need to be very, very careful when we say these type of things, even though they may be true, because others can accuse us of that same type of mindset. For example, you know, the Sunday evening service. I said I love Sunday evenings. Most of our congregations have a Sunday evening service in addition to a morning service, but what is it really? Well, it's a tradition. It's not a teaching of the Bible. We have a Wednesday night service, a tradition, not, not a teaching in the Bible. Now there may be good reasons for these traditions and they may serve a good and biblical purpose, but they're traditions nevertheless. Or we meet in a church building. We don't need a church building to be a church. Early Christians met wherever, wherever you know, was convenient or available. Church buildings are convenient, of course, but they're convenient traditions. How about Sunday morning worship? You know, we tell the joke, you know, what time's your worship? Oh, it's at the scriptural time, 10 a.m. You know, we'd say that tongue in cheek. Early Christians, especially Gentile slaves, you know, they met on Sunday evenings. Why? Because they had to work. No such thing as a day off. The teaching is to meet on the Lord's Day, Acts 20 verse 7, to meet on the Lord's Day to share in the communion, but there's no specified time. How about the order of worship? That we sit in rows facing the front? There's a church in, uh, in Ontario, I remember, <clears throat> Lord's Church, and this group moved out of one small building and they bought a synagogue. And in the synagogue they were lined up this way. Our benches are this way, their benches were this way, and the front was here, and they were facing each other. They weren't about to tear all the benches out, so they just met facing each other. That we have song books, that song leaders and prayer leaders come up to the front behind the microphone that we have a table you know, with the, the plates here, the metal plates in the back with bread, and fruit of the vine, and special containers, that we sing a song before and after communion, and we have men distributing all the trays. 
that we make a collection after we take the bread and the wine, that the sermon lasts 30 minutes after the communion, and then there's an invitation song, that the service lasts an hour. All of these things, they're, they're traditions that we've invented or copied or imposed on ourselves and we perpetuate each week. Now, I've not named them all, just the obvious ones that we kind of know. Now, there's a reason why these traditions are, are good, they're good things. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that traditions are bad in themselves. I'm not here to rail against the fact that we have a Sunday night service, of course not. Traditions can be good if they are ways that we organize and perform spiritual activities based on Bible teaching. They help us do things in a decent and orderly way, which Paul the Apostle says we must do in the church in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. He, that, that was their problem. They were doing things, spiritual things, but they were doing them in, in a disorderly way and it was causing confusion, it was causing a division and so on and so forth. And so he exhorts them to you know, put some order into things, do things in a decent and orderly way. Traditions help us do things in a way that is pleasing to God. They also help us identify our spiritual tasks and enable us to train others in the activity of worship and church activity. Imagine if we did the communion different every week. Every week we did it differently. One week everybody comes up to the front and takes the, the little communion cups you know, and they drink it and then they go and sit down. The following week, no, we're going to distribute them. The, the following week after that, uh, 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 you know, we'll start with this side and then they'll finish and they'll sing a song. Then we'll do this side and then this side will sing. You know, imagine the confusion. We'd still be serving the Lord's Supper, but if there was no order, if there was no tradition, there would be confusion. It wouldn't be edifying. And so, so long as tradition is squarely based on biblical teaching and done with the purpose of doing spiritual things in an orderly way, well then those traditions have value. And I believe sincerely that they're blessed by God. Of course, sometimes a good tradition goes bad. Traditions run into problems two ways. <clears throat> First of all, when we create a religious tradition without biblical basis. You know, I, as you, many of you know, I grew up Catholic as a boy. We had no meat on Friday. In Quebec, no meat on Friday. Every restaurant you went to in Quebec, when I was a kid in the 50s, early 60s, you'd go to a restaurant and every Friday, the main special, fish and chips. Fish and chips. If you went to a restaurant on a Friday in Quebec in 1955 and you ordered a hamburger steak on a Friday, you'd have to wait a long time to get it because they had nothing ready. Everyone was Catholic. Nobody ate meat on Friday. It was a sin. It was a mortal sin if you ate meat on Friday. Or the fact that priests are not allowed to marry. I speak of this because simply I was a Catholic. I understand it. I taught school in the Catholic school system. So I understand that religion. Yeah, priests are not allowed to marry. The big decision for a young man, quote, who wants to go into ministry, if he is Catholic, if he feels a calling, if he feels a desire to serve God in some way, the big decision that he has to make is, am I willing to go without being married for my entire life in order to do this thing? What a burden. Imagine all of you, you elders and you deacons and you preachers. Imagine if in order to be an elder, in order to be a deacon, in order to be a preacher, you had to give up married life. That's a burden, that's a tradition that it isn't based on anything biblical. There's no command, there's no example, there's no logical conclusion that suggests either of these teachings in the New Testament. These things were a religious invention by human beings. They may have had some good purposes, may have had some objectives that they wanted to reach with this that you know, seemed right at the time. But we know that these things lead or led to trouble and 
Confusion, again, I look back at the past in the Catholic Church, I mean. All these people that for years and years sacrificed not eating meat on Friday, so on and so forth, felt all guilty because perhaps you know, they, they slipped up or they, they gave in to temptation. And then one day the Catholic Church said, you know what, forget about that. We're not going to do that anymore. It's okay, go ahead and eat meat on Friday. Well, what? <laughs> My whole life I've been not eating meat on Friday, making this effort, and you're telling me, ah, it's okay, go ahead, forget about it. It's good, we're good. We're changing the rule. What used to be a sin, you know what? It's not a sin anymore. And I don't even want to go into the problems created by forced celibacy. We don't even want to go there, do we? We just have to read in the newspapers. We just have to read in the newspapers about the trouble caused by forcing men and women to be celibate in order to serve God. Another problem, when we elevate our traditions to the level of biblical teaching. So we run into trouble with traditions if they're based, you know, they're not based on the Bible, or if we take our traditions and we raise them up in importance and authority to the same level as Bible teaching. In other words, when our traditions begin having the same authority as the Bible teaching that they're based on. This leads to legalism and dogmatism. These lead to arguments and division. Well, we've never done that before. And if we do it that way, if, if you decide, if the elders decide to do it this way from now on, I don't know what it, you know, we're going to start serving communion in the auditorium on Sunday night. Well, I, we've never done that before. If that's the way you, I think I'm going to go find myself a church you know, that follows the straight and narrow. Or when we fight over competing traditions, liberal, conservative, you know, we, we, we point at each other. It's so interesting. <laughs> Back in the 90s when I was preaching here you know, at Choctaw, uh, there were some ministers, I won't name them, but there were some ministers who wrote me up in their bulletins as being a liberal. I think it's because I was using PowerPoint. <laughs> oh, you, you're laughing? They wrote me up, I was a liberal. And then I went to California to preach in San Diego. You know it's coming, right? <laughs> there were complaints by church members that I, well, I, you went and got that conservative from Oklahoma and brought him out here? <laughs> Us teaching the same thing. When there's competition, you know Satan is at work. When there's competition, in the church, not competition for good works. You know, one thing I've never seen people say, uh, we need people to uh, uh, deliver groceries at night in the rain to some of our shut-ins. We need three volunteers. You know what, I, 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 don't rare, I rarely see people say, no, get out of the way, I want to go. No, I want to go. Well, we, look, we've got seven volunteers, only three delivery. No, I want to go. Look, I'll give you money. I'll give, 50, I'll give you $50 if you let me take your turn and I go you know, do the benevolent. I, I don't see that. But I'll see people fight to the death over, you know, do we have communion in here or over there? I'll see them fight to the death over that one. So how do we avoid the extremes? You know, we need to organize ourselves. We need to have an orderly way to worship and to serve God. And doing this, needing this, will invariably lead us to creating traditions and religious habits. We can't get away from that. How can we make sure that we remain the masters of our traditions and not the slaves of our traditions? A couple of things, easy things. Number one, know the teachings of Christ. Know them. You can't obey them if you don't know them. Paul said to Timothy, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed. 
handling accurately the word of truth. Second Timothy chapter two, verse 15. If we know exactly what the word teaches, we will not let anyone impose anything on us and will not make this mistake ourselves. And I know this, people say, well, how did you, how did you get out of the Catholic Church? How did you find your way to the Church of Christ? Now that would seem simple if you're living in Oklahoma or Kentucky, or, you know, but if you're living in French Canada, trust me, the Church of Christ, not even a blip on the horizon. I mean, it's, it's hardly not there. Total mission field. How does somebody come out of Catholicism? And remember, I mean, I was French, my father was Italian, if you're half French and half Italian, trust me, you're Catholic. There's no way around it in, in the province of Quebec. I was an altar boy. I went to seminary. I taught in the Catholic School Commission. I taught catechism. I belonged to our, our high school group. I belonged to the Legion of Mary. That was our club. That was our social service club. So I know about Catholicism. They say, well, how did you go out of Catholicism? And you know what the answer to that question is? Nobody knocked on my door. Nobody invited me to a church meeting. There was no such thing as a gospel meeting. I've never been to Sunday school in my life. No, I came out of Catholicism because one day I started reading the Bible. Just like that. One day I went to the store and I was taking a long train trip and I needed a book to read on the train, simple as that, as banal as that. I wasn't searching for God. I was just searching for a cheap book that would keep me busy for a two and a half day train ride out to the West Coast. And there was a King James Version Bible for sale at the bookstore in the train station and all they wanted for it was five bucks. And I said, well, I can knock this thing off in a couple of days, surely. <laughs> and I haven't stopped reading it since. You know, people say, you know, our Catholic neighbor, blah, blah, how do I reach out to them? Do I debate that? No, if you can just get them to read the Bible. You know, well, do I have a Bible study? I don't know a lot about the doctrines. No, 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 no. Just sit down and open the Bible with them and just have them read it or you read it, just read it. And eventually they'll get to the point where I got and that was, wait a minute, wait a minute, that's not what I was taught. That's not how we did it. And the first you know, bump, the first bridge you have to cross was what do I believe? What I was taught, what I was used to, or what's written in the book? That's the bridge. Some people won't cross it. They'll say, no, I just, I can't go any further. Oh, well, too bad. If we know what the word teaches, we will not let anyone impose anything on us. We won't make the mistake of basing any of our religious habits, spiritual traditions, functional traditions on something which is not biblical. Why? Because we know what it says. I remember when the Boston movement, some of you remember that, the Boston movement, came to Montreal and several of their leaders had a meeting with me. I was you know, preaching for a small church back in those days. And they said, you need to come with us. You're a young guy, you're a dynamic guy, blah, blah, blah. You, know, you come with us, you know, we're, we're going to have success. This, we're going to plant the Montreal Church of Christ. You know, we're going to do it. And I read some of their material and so on and so forth. This was way back at the beginning. You know? And my answer to them was, are you kidding me? I was in a religious jail for you know, 30 years. You're not getting me back to that jail. You're not getting me back into bondage. How could I avoid that? Because I knew what it said. 
and I read what they said, and what they were saying was not the same thing that this was said. Another way to avoid. Know the difference between teaching and tradition. I mean, know the difference. We need to understand that the teaching is that we meet together, for example, on the Lord's Day to share the Lord's Supper and to surround this with praise and prayer and teaching and fellowship and encouragement and support. This is the teaching. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, 12, 13, you know, several chapters. Acts chapter 2, verses 42 down to 46. This is the teaching. Now where we do this and when we do it and the order we do it in and how much praise compared to prayer or teaching, all of this is tradition. When we make the building a sacred place, when we make the order, uh, the, the order in which we do things a sacred order, then we become slaves to our tradition and as a consequence our worship, the main thing, becomes dry and boring and ineffective, both here on earth and in heaven well. And then maybe one other way to avoid the mistakes that I've spoken of. Let's make sure that we obey the main teaching. The main teaching in Christianity, and I know everybody likes to distill it down to one thing, but Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5, but the goal of our instruction, wait a minute, the goal, okay, the objective, the goal of our instruction, our teaching, the apostles' teaching, what is it he said? Love from a pure heart. Love from a pure heart. In the church there is always a lot of wrestling over how to do things, how to set the tradition, why not to change the tradition? This is the basis of much of the eventual division in the church and the hurt feelings that result. But if we remember that maintaining my loving relationship with my brother and sister is more important in God's eyes than any of our traditions, it will help us to be patient with each other when differences occur, and there will be differences. Jesus didn't come to die for our traditions of the church. He came for the people in the church. Let's not forget that in our zeal to protect our traditions, we might be harming the people that Christ died for. So with this in mind, let's remember that even though the way we do things tonight, for example, is different than the way we did it this morning, it is of equal value in God's eyes. For example, those who will take communion tonight standing in the fellowship hall have worshiped as effectively as those who have participated in the Lord's Supper in a more formal way this morning. What makes our tradition acceptable is if they are based on the teachings of Christ to begin with and if they enable us to carry out those teachings in an orderly way while maintaining the Spirit's purpose within the teaching. You know, we do things differently on Sunday evenings for the communion. However, the way we do it is orderly, and the way we do it is respectfully, and it maintains the spirit of Jesus' teaching to remember Him by sharing these emblems. The tradition changes from Sunday morning to Sunday night, but the obedience to the main teaching does not. And we have to be able to see the difference. So let's keep this in mind when we see various traditions being changed or new ones being, being added. Ask yourselves, what teaching is this tradition based on? And is it accurately helping us to respond or to carry out the teachings of our Lord? Surely, we need to speak out, if not. Unfortunately, many times division occurs when brethren take exception to traditions that they are not used to, even if they are in perfect harmony with Bible teaching. We need to ask ourselves that question. Is it bugging me just because it's different for me? Or is it bugging me because I clearly see it's violating scripture? You know, before we speak out, we need to make sure that we know which side of that a question we're falling on. 
Well, there's certainly one tradition that is evident at every service and based on the clear teaching of scripture, and that's the invitation. Jesus invited all who had ears, all who had understanding to come to Him and He would give them rest. Matthew 11, 28. Peter the apostle exhorted the crowd more than once to respond to his message. In Acts 2, 40 he says, or Luke describes what Peter is saying, and with many other words he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. I've always found that interesting that Peter exhorts them, tells them, repent, be baptized, and so on and so forth, and then this passage comes along, and it says, and he kept repeating it and exhorting them and inviting them, and then it says, 3,000 were baptized. Ananias encouraged Saul to obey the gospel once he had preached it to him. Now, why do you delay? Get up and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on his name, Acts 22, 16. I've just picked a couple. In each instance, the people and the location, the circumstances were different, but what remained the same was the fact that God requires an answer from us concerning certain matters, especially when the teaching involves the question of salvation. Our tradition is to ask, our tradition here at Choctaw is to encourage our tradition here, supported and confirmed by our elders, is that we exhort the congregation to respond to God in faith and repentance and obedience every time we preach His word from this pulpit, no matter who does it. We have guest speakers sometimes on Sunday mornings or Sunday night, and one of the things they ask uh, Marty or myself is, now would you like me to offer an invitation? Do you do that here? And the answer to that question is always, oh yes. Every time the word is preached from this pulpit, we're to offer the invitation. That's our tradition, but it's a tradition not just made up out of, you know, uh, uh, in a vacuum. It's a tradition based squarely on what we see the apostles and the evangelists doing in the New Testament. And so, our tradition is to ask and encourage and exhort the congregation to respond to God in faith and repentance and obedience every time we teach His word. We've chosen to use different words each time. We don't have a special prayer that's been written out for us that the, that the preachers have to repeat. We can, we can couch it in whatever terms we like. We've decided to do it at the end of the preaching, at each service, but we don't necessarily do it in the classroom. That's our tradition. Maybe some other church, the elders will say, you know what we want? We want all the Bible teachers at the end of every class to offer an invitation to their class. In addition to what will be done during the sermon, that's fine, that'd be their tradition, based on the same teaching. And we ask those who respond to come down front to speak to an elder, perhaps fill out a card. That's our tradition. We've built upon the teaching that we have in the Bible. I mean, I've seen it done differently in other places. I've preached at places where the invitation is always given, but the response, the church is guided to respond by going and meeting with the elders after the service. After the closing prayer, whoever wanted to respond goes to the, a room on the side and several elders were there and that person would go meet with the elders and talk about what their response was for baptism, counseling, forgiveness, response, whatever it was, placing membership. That's the way they did it. Was that okay? Is that okay? Of course it is. What's biblical is that we need to encourage people to respond to God's word with faith and obedience. What's tradition is how we organize ourselves to do so. When brethren learn the difference between tradition and teaching, there is more harmony and a lot less division in the church. And so according to our tradition, based on God's word, I invite those who have not obeyed the gospel in repentance and baptism and confession of Christ to do so tonight if you haven't done it. And I also encourage those who may be guilty of judging others because they did not recognize the difference between teaching and tradition, I encourage you, repent. Repent and ask God to give you a more gracious spirit. And for those who need prayers of encouragement to remain faithful, for those who want to be restored, for those who are struggling with sin, struggling with issues, physical illness, whatever it is, 
Our elders are here to lay hands on you, to pray with you, to hear your confession of faith, whatever it may be. The invitation is yours this night. Please respond if you need to as we stand and as we sing our, our song of encouragement.